Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. And uh, Madam Clerk, we have regrets from Councillor Chisholm. And the rest of us are all in our places uh, and ready to go. Uh, Councillor, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, there are none. Uh, we need a mover and seconder to resolve in the Committee of the Whole for planning decisions. Councillor Giddings and Councillor Elgar, all in favor? And that's carried. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in consideration of the agenda and the number of people who've turned out, uh, we can't always predict what item is going to draw the most audience participation. I, um, I'm going to use one of my few powers as mayor to vary the agenda and bring forward a couple of items that, as a convenience to, uh, to people. And council, that would be the confidential item C1 and the confidential item C3. And I would suggest to you that C3 is a matter that can be dispatched uh, with great alacrity if one of you will just move it for me. Councillor Giddings, all those in favor? Opposed to Finney, and there you go, Mr. Cozy. I, I hope that, and that's as, as revised and put on us, we, we don't, there you go. Now, uh, C1. In the case of C1, we have interest from many people who are here tonight, and we have interest from at least two delegations. And our custom is to poll the audience. Um, and uh, the matter before us is the council is going to decide what, it's, what position it's going to take at the local planning appeal tribunal. And there is a, um, a confidential report from the legal department giving advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, giving advice to council on the matter. Um, council is happy to get advice from every direction. Uh, what it's not willing to do is to uh, open up the kimono, if you will, and violate the, uh, the confidentiality of advice subject to solicitor client privilege. Uh, after we've heard from the delegations and uh, had whatever discussion may ensue, council will then vote in public on what to do. So I hope that sets the table for everybody. And, um, and now all I need to do is ask the clerk to call the first uh, delegation. The first delegation on item C1 is uh, Harry Shea from the Bronte Village Residents Association. Welcome, Mr. Shea. Council looks forward to your information. Mr. Mayor, I would ask your indulgence if I could uh, reserve the balance of my time and ask uh, Ennis Clare to go first. Is that, do is that doable? Uh, why don't you just go ahead, sir? Okay, that's fine. Um, so my prepared remarks are as follows. Uh, here we go. Mr. Mayor, members of council, my name is Harry Shea, and I'm representing the BVRA. Tonight, you will hear from Ken Moffitt from Ennis Clare, who will address the areas of great, uh, in great uh, detail. The BVRA can anything new, can't add anything new that won't be discussed uh, by him. We can only reemphasize his points regarding current overintensification of the site, insufficient parking, and the streetscape and residential character that will be dramatically altered if this proposal is allowed to go forward due to massing and lack of appropriate setbacks. We respectfully uh, request that the, the council deny this application. Thank you very much, Mr. Shea. Council appreciates your advice. Um, Madam Clerk, the next delegation. Next delegation is Ken Moffat. Mr. Moffat, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Uh, thank you to Council for uh, advancing this item on the agenda. Uh, good evening, Mayor Burton and members of Council. My name is Ken Moffat. I represent the vast majority of more than 1,000 residents and owners of 2170, 2175, 2180, and 2185 Marine Drive. In order to respect your time during this busy meeting agenda, we have elected to have only one representative speak on your behalf. I drew the short straw. 
However, you should not make the mistake, uh, you should not make mistake this choice as a weakening in our resolve on this issue from when over 100 residents attended the first council meeting to consider this matter on September 11, and several hundred of us signed a petition submitted to the town. More recently, hundreds of our residents have corresponded with the mayor and lo our local councillors, and men many members of our community are again in attendance tonight to express our deep, ongoing opposition to the pro proposed development by Great West Life at 2220 Marine Drive. I acknowledge with, with thanks the fact that the mayor has endeavored to respond to each and every letter that he has received. I also acknowledge that councillors O'Meara and Robinson have not yet responded, but note that councillor Robinson has been out of the country until today and that neither councillor O'Meara or councillor Robinson have had have su the support staff that would per permit them to make an immediate response to individual residents. We look forward to their response in due course. However, while responses to these letters are appreciated and important, of far more importance to us is how each member of this council acts in response to this issue. Your decision this evening will have a significant and long-lasting impact on the quality of life that residents and families have come to experience and value by choosing to live in this particular Oakville neighborhood. Here are the reasons why you should not support the two amendments requested by the applicant. The development has been proposed as an intensification project in, li in line with the provincial Ontario direction for municipalities. However, this development does not meet the tests in our own livable Oakville plan. With respect to an intensification in density, maximum density permitted on a site with high, a residential high density designation is 185 units per hectare. The existing density on the site is 202 units per hectare, exceeding the bylaw maximum by 9.2%. So the site is currently not underutilized. The proposal asks for approval to increase the density on the site to 239 units per hectare, exceeding the bylaw maximum by 54 units per hectare, or 29.2%. The site does not meet the criteria for density intensification outside of a growth area because it is not underutilized. Irrespective of whether proposed development, the proposed development complies with provincial and regional development mandates in support of intensification, the site is not an appropriate candidate for further intensification under our Livable Oakville plan. With respect to parking, the developer proposes to reduce the overall number of existing parking spaces by nine spaces while adding 27 more units to this site. In the zoning bylaw, the total parking requirement for this site is 246 spaces. Currently, there are only 225 spaces. The applicant proposes 216 parking spaces, nine fewer than currently exist, and 30 fewer than the zoning bylaw requires. Insufficient parking on site will result in an overload in overload parking on the streets of our neighborhood, increasing traffic congestion, driving hazards, and risk for pedestrians, many who, of whom are senior citizens. The proposal does not conform to the parking requirements of our zoning bylaw and defies logic by proposing to provide less parking with more res residents on the site. With regard to the community character, our residential neighborhood is characterized by established condos and townhouses which all have unique characteristics while respecting the relative homogeneity of the neighborhood. This neighborhood is devoid of displays of industrial elements and mechanical apparatus. The proposed development will eliminate the green space, erecting in its place a modern building with its mass in relation to the site and its design characteristics is not consistent with the neighborhood character. 14 rooftop terraces, dubbed entertainment spaces, will be concentrated together at a height of approximately 60 feet from the ground and laid wide open to the view of all adjacent renters and owners. Access to these terraces will be via eight staircase access units, each the size of an industrial warehouse storage container. Additional mechanical apparatus in terms of ventilation, heating, and cooling units will be installed on the rooftop. Thirteen ground-level patios will also permit barbecue units in their respective entertainment places. The rooftop of the proposed development with its eight staircase units, the terraces with their barbecues and entertainment devices, and the mechanical and service apparatus with its accompanying noise will all combine to create an outlandish assembly of residential and industrial elements, 
over 8,000 square feet in size, that will fundamentally alter the very quiet and serene residential nature and character of this site and our neighborhood. Lastly, with respect to streetscape, the livable Oakville plan requires that, quote, development should be compatible with a setbacks orientation and separation distances within the surrounding neighborhood. The current site has an abundance of grass, trees, and flowers on a spacious lawn that provides a respectful separation between surrounding buildings and Marine Drive, all consistent with the setbacks and separations of the surrounding buildings in the neighborhood. The proposed development will give this site a character and an appearance on the streetscape that would be unique in the neighborhood. Minimum front yard setback and a minimum interior and side yard sex setbacks will be severely reduced to one-tenth of the current requirements and two-thirds of the residential high-rise requirements. Thirteen ground-level open patios will be intrusive to the privacy of neighboring residents. The reduced front yard setbacks and ground-level patios fronting on Marine Drive will be intrusive to pedestrian movement and will create a sense of crowding on Marine Drive. The proposal does not conform to any of the setback requirements of the zoning bylaw and removes the landscaping elements that would support appropriate separation and privacy. In conclusion, this proposed development is wrong for this site. This development proposal asks Council to ignore its own policies contained in our Livable Oakville plan and the zoning bylaw. Despite having enumerated several separate attributes that cause us to oppose this development proposal, it is the very existence of the entire building that we find objectionable. Accordingly, we do not believe that it is appropriate or even possible to attempt to achieve a compromise solution to this issue. We urge Town Council to take the action necessary to support residents of our neighborhood and to oppose this development application. Thank you for the opportunity to again share with you our views in opposition to this proposed development. Thank you very much, Mr. Moffat, for your information. Are there questions for the gentleman? Yes, sir. Councillor Elgar. Yeah, I appreciate the decorum we have. I just wonder how many people uh, that you have, you've, you're representing tonight, if they'd put up their hands so we could see. Okay, that's not that, a bad crowd. Is that enough thank for you? you? <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, sir. You. <coughs> Council, I would indicate that uh, the legal report is complete and uh, I can't, I, I'm having trouble imagining that there could be any need to go into camera to ask questions about it. I thought it was uh, very uh, well done. And uh, Councillor Robinson, do you have questions? No, Your Worship, I have a motion. Well, let's hear your motion. I move that the legal staff be directed to oppose the appeals to the local planning appeal tribunal filed by such a number Ontario Incorporated and another Ontario number with respect to the development of 2220 Marine Drive. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Shall I put the vote? All those in favor of the motion? Could I have asked for a recorded vote, please? You can always ask for a recorded vote. If you are in support of Councillor Robinson's motion, please rise to be named. That would be Councillor Lischina, Councillor Adams. <laughs> Let's get to the end. <laughs> we should have no applause before it's time. Um, did I manage to say Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Grant, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Longo, Councillor Elgar, Councillor Hutchins, Councillor Giddings, oh, there you are, Councillor Duddock, Councillor Robinson, Councillor O'Meara and Mayor Burton, I declare your motion carried, sir. <coughs> now you can do it. Again. So now, um, I just want to uh, offer you two things. I'm going to offer you a brief recess in case you don't want to stay and enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that the planning issues that were identified by the residents will be defended by staff at the, uh, at the local planning appeal tribunal. So with that, I'm going to have a, a two-minute recess on condition that you leave quickly and quietly. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm calling the meeting back to order. And uh, council, how about we dispatch item C2 with a quick motion to withdraw the item since there is no update. Councilor Elgar, all in favor? That's carried and the item is withdrawn. So now we can turn our attention to the consent agenda and that is the Glen Abbey update and the report from legal department. And uh, I don't know that we actually have an additional report. So therefore, it's moved uh, that uh, the information be received by Councillor Elgar. Well, Councillor Duddick, please have your say. I just wanted to congratulate staff on providing the timeline. It's provided some clarity. I know several people have been asking. They, they hear about one thing and another thing and where everything is. So the fact that we have such a clear timeline and uh, chart to work from is appreciated, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. May I put the vote? All those in favor? And the item is received. Now we turn to our public hearing items, and the first is the public meeting report for the former Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital lands draft plan of subdivision. And uh, if you give your attention to Lee Musson, she will review for the public the information you've studied so carefully, Council. And uh, then we will have the registered delegations, uh, and I believe we have uh, a couple. Lee? Good evening, Mayor Burton, members of Council. This evening, you can find my staff report on page 11 of your agenda. This is the statutory public meeting for a draft plan of subdivision on the former hospital lands, which would have the effect of creating 35 residential lots consisting of 19 detached dwellings fronting onto McDonald Road and Allen Street, and 16 multiple attached dwelling units internal to the site. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to obtain any further public and council input related to this application. Planning staff are not making a recommendation at this time and the report is to be received by council. However, it is staff's intention to bring forward a recommendation report for a decision at the July 9th, 9th Planning and uh, Development Council meeting. The former hospital lands are located within an established residential area generally bounded by McDonald Road, Allen Street, and Reynolds Street. The entire, the entire hospital lands are approximately 6.7 hectares in size, um, and the portion of the lands which are subject to the draft plan of subdivision is approximately one hectare in size. In terms of some surrounding land uses, to the north and east are one, one and a half, and two-story detached dwellings. South is a two-story Wyndham Manor, a long-term care facility, a six-story apartment building, future townhouse development on Shedden Avenue and Wallace Park. To the west is one, one and a half, and two-story detached dwellings, a four-story apartment buildings, and four-story medical building. Just in terms of a little bit of background, the South Central Public Land Use Study was completed in 2013 and was a comprehensive land use study focused on several properties. The study addressed three surplus school sites, the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital, the Oakville Arena site, including the, Trafalgar, the surrounding Trafalgar Park. The study incorporated extensive public community engagement and technical analysis for each site. Through the study, council endorsed a land use option for the former hospital lands. Throughout 2017, there has been additional public consultation regarding the overall design of the entire OTMH site and its component land uses. Council approved an updated site master plan in June 2017, which was derived from the public input on several different site design options. The preferred master plan includes a community center, associated park, and parking garage, residential land uses, the preservation of the former Oakville Trafalgar High School in conjunction with future senior oriented housing. The effect of the draft plan of subdivision would be to subdivide the northern portion of the former hospital lands to create residential lots and blocks in a manner consistent with the land use planning and zoning bylaw approved by council in December of 2017. This report focuses on the residential component of the draft plan. As of the writing of the staff report, the balance of the former hospital site, which contains the community's future community center, the seniors oriented housing block, the civic square, square and open space was included within the draft plan of subdivision. However, there are sub separate uh, applications for consent, which would have the effect of creating those parcels to address timing issues. 
Uh, just as a, an update, in term, uh, last week, the Committee of Adjustment approved the consent applications, and as such, those blocks will be removed from the draft plan of subdivision. So again, the intent of this draft plan of subdivision is to create 19 dwelling lots fronting on McDonald Road and Allen Street, and two internal blocks containing 16 multiple attached dwellings fronting on an internal L-shaped road. The park block, which is, is associated with the community centre block. In January of this year, OPA 23 came into effect and was the amendment that implemented the preferred master plan for the former hospital lands, which was endorsed by Council in June. In January 2018, OPA 23 was deemed to be consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to the growth plan and the regional official plan. It allows for the redevelopment of the property for a community centre, park, parking garage, residential land uses, not exceeding 29 units per site hectare, as well as seniors oriented housing. This staff report addresses that area of the draft plan of subdivision that is designated low density residential, medium density residential, and parks and open space as identified on Schedule G, which is the southeast land use within a livable Oakville plan. It is intended that the draft plan of sub subdivision would implement the town's official plan. A site-specific zoning bylaw was passed by Council in December of last year and included regulations for the residential development. These lands are zoned RL3, subject to a site-specific 283, which is a residential low density, and RM1, subject to site-specific 283, which is re residential medium density, and CU383, which is community use. It is intended that the residential lots would be developed in accordance with the zoning, approved zoning. Matters that will be considered as part of the future recommendation report. Uh, the project or the proposed development will be evaluated to ensure that it represents a form of development that is encouraged by the policy framework established by the provincial policy statement, the growth plan and the regional official plan and the livable Oakville plan. The subdivision will be evaluated against residential component of the council endorsed master plan. These lands were the focus of a comprehensive land use study Dating back to 2013, staff will evaluate this proposal as it relates to the surrounding context. Staff will complete their review of the technical documents submitted as part of the application, which included the functional servicing and stormwater management, tree protection, transportation impact, and other public uses. It should be noted that the proposed park north of the community centre is subject to a comprehensive design exercise coordinated, the park, coordinated by the Parks and Open Space de uh, Department. In conclusion, staff are put, putting forward this recommendation, and again, it is staff's intention to bring forward a recommendation at the July 9th Planning and Development Council. Thank you very much, Ms. Musson. Are there questions? Madam Clerk, would you call the, uh, the delegation? The delegation speaking to this item is Dr. Edna Tullock-King. Welcome, Ms. Tullock King. Uh, we're interested to hear your, your, your information. If you could speak in the direction of the microphone, it will assist people at home to hear you as well. Thank you very much, sir. Good evening, everybody. I think everybody has known me since I came to Oakville in, uh, on the 11th of July, 2008. And the first time I spoke to this council, and also when I was invited by my member of parliament then, uh, Terence Young, uh, to give my input into the then uh, on the way, well on the way plan of the new memorial hospital and other economic developments therewith within Oakville, Halton community, Greater Toronto, and the whole region. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I, I came here and married my husband, Dr. Clarence Albert King. I think you all know him. He's 59 years a Canadian citizen, and uh, he has worked the first uh, professor of mathematics of Sheridan, um, Sheridan. Clarence, you should speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, yes, he's, 
he he is very happy to be here, and I think we he is the one who brought me here and why I'm still here, and he's the reason why I, I'm uh, addressing you tonight. I found it my duty because I made it my moral principle when I discovered and had many conversations with Mayor Burton and the previous uh, mayor at that time about the international worldwide view of Oakville to make Oakville the best city in Canada. And by juxtaposition, the best city in the world. This is not a mean matter because I came here having completed a tour of duty of five countries, uh, five continents of the world, and the only continent I did not choose to go was Antarctica, and the other one was uh, the Arctic region. But I found that Canada was so involved, and in fact, you are the leader of whatever will come out of uh, where this, uh, this, uh, this investigation is leading. I am very proud to be here this evening to hear the report of the hospital because I became very involved in it. And to give my own contribution, I then registered a small company, the Bioethic Family Living Institute, at my address and aided and abetted by my neighbor, who was then Gord Williams. And I've heard so many things about Gord Williams. And in fact, he is echoing and echoing and echoing in the Glen Abbey affair to know how rooted his contribution has been. After that, I went into examining the foundation of my, con my proposed contribution by examining a very important document that the spirit of Ottawa. This was signed by, by uh, the president, then president of Canada, Pierre Trudeau, and my then president of Jamaica, where I was born, Norman uh, uh, Michael Manley. His father was Norman Manley, well known in Queen circles and considered one of the fathers of the Commonwealth of Nations. That said, I came here this evening and I'm so glad I'm here to hear that report and to know that you are continuing now to marry what happened in the hospital to the community and then give it to the people. And anything at all I speak or come out of this document that I intend to table to you in the future weeks is that the whole effort belongs to the people. I am not very happy at some of the rumblings, the policy rumblings, and also the people investigation rumblings that are happening in my beloved country, Canada. Because I took it on myself, and as a nurse, I did not say that, I am a nurse of 65 years and midwife. I am 83 years, and after consulting in with the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and some of its substitute and contributory agencies, including the Refugee Commission, I stand here before you saying that it all belongs to the people. And when the people begin to grumble, and I hear the grumblings about taxation, I hear so many grumblings. I hear the grumblings of the elderly. I know they have been seemingly well treated, but I asked my husband and persuaded on him to come with me tonight. He didn't come with me, I brought him. 
<laughs> so he came of the sufferings of the people. And in conclusion, I am inviting this body to continue to extensively review the work that has been done in the past 10 years, and now to look very closely at what is happening to the community input into uh, the community hospital, what it will become, and do not ignore the cryings of the people, and do not put behind you the Glen Abbey report. Because I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives long after they are gone. And we are inheriting uh, four world wars. I, they say it was two, but I say it was four world wars. And the ultimate world war now is the war against the spirit of the people. And that is the document and the evaluation that was concerned in this document, Mr. Mayor, that I am putting before you as the ultimate study document for all the efforts we have tried. I will not bore you because I think I have failed and there is nothing better than a failure about a trial. At 83 years old, and with my husband now, having retired from uh, Sheridan, and has now put not only, not only Sheridan or Canada, but the Commonwealth on the map of Star Wars. And we will remember and be very grateful to uh, the, the background young men of 1977, and that I wrote the document which, Norma, which uh, Michael Manley brought and tabled that was eventually signed as the community, as a communique, and nothing has been done about it. And I rise to say that in my subsequent fa failure, I am continuing to support the people. Because in the spirit of Ottawa, I will use Isaiah 61 and ask everyone in Canada to rise, shine, your light has come, and use your experience and the experience of the Commonwealth to lead the world. It must be done. It shall be done. I will be returning home to my country, Jamaica. But I will not leave this effort undone. In the interest, I have decided that I will continue my, my, my work through the Commonwealth of Nations because we have 53 countries in the world that represent the Commonwealth. And it's the greatest power block. And it's the most democratic power block and it's the most vibrant Ms. Tullo King, Ms. And Africa Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for your no, information. Okay. May I just you... apologize and say that I have been taken unawares, but my husband in crisis, I will leave here by the end of the month. I am going away for a break. I have registered this as a private, not uh, private, for-profit corporation. My lawyer is Gary Hofferis, and you will hear more from this committee. Everything is set, and I have brought also, and would like to leave with the uh, clerk, some documents, and one other thing, that there will be three, three projects to test the evaluation one in Canada, one in the Caribbean, and one 
in the Union of Africa. Thank you, and long live the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, ma'am. Do you need help with uh, your husband to, to get out and everything? Thank you. You did recognize that we are suffering. I could write a document on the poor and on the, the health services, I can, but I will not. Thank you for your help. I can get you some help to Thank maneuver you, to the... I have been wanting to see you for four months, ask Lisa, and I cannot speak to anybody. Thank you. Thank you. So. And people arise. <laughs> so if, if, if you're... Are you ready to go now, or would you like help later? No, I would like, there's another, uh, I would just say something. This hinges on three very important questions that are coming up. Well, let's, let's wait. I we... did tell your, I did tell your, can I say that I told you? And those were the things that are spread throughout here that are hinged with this okay. question. I would like to hear one about the subdivisions. May I? Because housing is very important. No, you're, you're out of time on this item, but we'll call you on the I other items it. that you registered for. In the name of our um, Thank it, you. It is good if you, <coughs> it's good if you speak to the subject at hand when you speak. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. And I love my country. Are, uh, and I excuse love me. Board. We'd like to get on with the meeting. Thank you. Uh, are there other delegations with information for council on this matter? Um, would one of the councillors like to move a motion to receive the information? Councillor Giddings, all in favor? That is carried and received. Um, Mr. Simeone, I, I note that there was nothing for you to add. Um, we now have number three, the public meeting report for the local variance criteria bylaw. And we have a presentation from Heinz Hecht and Mark Simeone. And I am just guessing that Mark, you might like to go first. Thank you, Your Worship, and to the members of council. I just have a few opening remarks. Um, there's been a lot of good conversations regarding the local variance criteria bylaw. We've had some excellent interactions with the uh, ratepayers groups and all of the words. We've walked through the words. Um, there is a great deal of interest within the community and, and from others from outside of the community. Um, we continue to work on protecting the characters of Oakfield neighbours on behalf of Council. And I would observe from a staff standpoint that we would see additional benefits if there was an opportunity to have more time for these, these conversations to occur. There's, it's a complex matter, there's some misunderstanding uh, amongst the groups and we'd like to have the chance to or at least put it out there for you to consider. Uh, to have to get it right to make sure that everybody understands where we're coming from and we can fine-tune this as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Heinz will proceed with the presentation, however. Thank you. Mr. Heck, we're all ears. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. Item 3 is a, uh, was to be a statutory public meeting for the uh, proposed local variance criteria bylaw. Just in terms of background, as part of the uh, official plan review and in support of the residential policy review, staff completed a residential character study which was presented to Council in March of this year. The, uh, the purpose of the residential character study was to assess the existing character of residential areas south of Dundas Street and understand with, uh, with the benefit of public input what elements and qualities influence character. Through a better understanding of what character means and what aspects of character are important to residents, staff determined that dwelling siting, the massing and height, and soft landscaping and trees are important elements uh, which contribute to the residential character in Oakville. As a component of that review, and as a result of the concerns expressed by residents and, and council regarding the extent of minor variance approvals related to building siting, the massing of dwellings, Council directed staff to prepare a local variance criteria bylaw. <clears throat> the uh, criteria bylaw would have the effect of establishing additional criteria to better deal with requests for large deviations to the zoning bylaw. 
that could have an impact on the residential character of neighborhoods. The proposed bylaw would, have, would provide an opportunity to better manage growth and change in stable residential neighborhoods and in a manner which strengthens the livable Oakville official plan and the urban design guidelines for stable residential communities, which is an important uh, planning tool to ensure compatibility uh, with, uh, within, new, uh, within neighborhoods. The, the framework uh, for how the bylaw is structured and how the thresholds were established are based upon minor variance trends which are highlighted in the report, indicating the volume of applications, the types of variances received as well as the average deviations received townwide. The bylaw would only apply to detached dwellings within the zero suffix zone. The specific threshold limits would apply to lot coverage, residential floor area, height, setbacks, and driveway width and coverage. The bylaw has been structured to ensure that new dwellings or additions are designed in a manner consistent with the design guidelines and to ensure that variances do not exceed predetermined thresholds. The variances would be required to conform to the thresholds without exceeding the average in the assessment area. The purpose and intent of the bylaw would be to provide criteria that a minor variance must conform with in addition to the four tests under the uh, Section 45.1 of the Planning Act before receiving approval from the Committee of Adjustment. The bylaw does not change how applications are evaluated but does provide additional clarity on what constitutes a minor variance for detached dwellings. The basis for the, the uh, local variance criteria bylaw is to address concerns raised by uh, uh, regarding large deviations beyond the bylaw requirements. The basis for establishing thresholds for specific regulations is to capture the common reoccurring variances that have the potential to impact character attributes. The thresholds are directly related to the findings of the character study and correlate with the trends of minor variance applications for the last two years. The basis for the assessment area is to reaffirm that neighborhood character is the driving determinant for the suitability of variances within these areas. If the neighborhood conditions present averages that are below the bylaw, the average could be maintained but no greater than the threshold provided. The proposed bylaw is not intended to create additional hardship to property owners who can demonstrate that there are unique conditions on the property that prevent compliance with the zoning bylaw. As noted in the report, the bylaw would provide exemptions for properties impacted by unusual or unique physical conditions including when required to accommodate matters related to the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontario, Ontarians with Disabilities Act. How will the bylaw be used? For the purpose of demonstrating how the thresholds and assessment are, are to be applied, we have used an example where an applicant is seeking an increase in lot coverage over the maximum 35% permitted for a property in the RL3 zero uh, suffix zone. An application must conform with the threshold without exceeding the average found in the assessment area. Applicants would be required to, to complete a neighborhood assessment to determine the existing built context. In this example, if the average lot coverage in the assessment area is 20.5%, in other words, if the neighborhood assessment demonstrates that the average lot coverage is below the current zoning standard or the requested coverage, then the variance would not be appropriate and would not be supported. Where the neighborhood assessment demonstrates that the average lot coverage within the assessment area exceeds the current standard of 35%, in this case 35.5%, then the maximum lot coverage could be 35.5%, but not the 37.8% listed in the local variance criteria bylaw. Where the assessment demonstrates that the average is above the bylaw, the applicant may be eligible for a minor variance up to that average, 
but no greater than the threshold values that are set out in the criteria bylaw. It should be noted that to obtain approval from the Committee of Adjustment, the applicant would still have to satisfy the other criteria, such as being consistent with the town's design guidelines, in addition to satisfying the other tests of a minor variance application. The variance would still be denied if any of the other tests are not met. The key point would be if the average is above the threshold value in the criteria bylaw, the threshold value would be the maximum deviation that could be achieved. In terms of the public uh, input, stakeholder input, uh, staff met with approximately 45 stakeholders and the public on April 19th. The feedback uh, that was received included concerns about the complexity of the bylaw and how it would be applied, including determining a suitable approach for identifying the built conditions within the assessment area. Considerations. It appears that the proposed uh, criteria bylaw may be the first bylaw of its kind in Ontario. Considerations for the bylaw are focused on fairness of its application and usability to implement policies of the official plan, namely uh, section 1119, the reasonableness of the criteria and how they are applied, ensuring that the thre thresholds and approach to the bylaw are defensible when challenged, and to increasing the predictability in outcomes of minor variance applications. In conclusion, any additional comments received from the public uh, and council will be considered and included in the future report and, and bylaw, which staff were considering bringing back to council in June of, of this year. Uh, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start off with a question. Are you quite sure that um, the amount of consultation that you want to do can be accommodated uh, and still get back in June, or do you need more time? Mr. Mayor, I believe that we would need uh, some more time to put together a, uh, a proper bylaw. We've received uh, some very good feedback from the industry and, and members of public. And, uh, and we'd like to use that information to craft a, uh, a revised bylaw that would uh, probably be an improvement from what uh, the draft is in the report. Thank you. Um, I'm not aware of any opposition to you taking the time you need to get it right on council. And uh, I just tell council and the public that the draft motion before council is that the comments from the public be received. There's no order from council on the, on the paper here that, that staff come back in June. So I, I hope that's helpful and clears things up on that front. Council, do you have questions on this? Councillor Grant? Thank you very much. Um, you, you use the phrase uh, using clear language a lot. So to use clear language, uh, this is to reduce the effect of the glut of what we call monster homes in certain areas. This is, is it not? That would be one of the intents of the bylaw, yes. So, very good, and thank you. And, and also, oh, we've, we've got a comment coming over here. Through your worship, I would, in addition to uh, what Heinz has indicated, but also suggest that it reinforces the, the objectives of 1119 and puts some more clarity and precision on the outcomes. Right now, we're dealing with subjective matters, and by uh, approaching it from the standpoint of this is the line, everything above the line, call it a major variance or perhaps a rezoning, everything below the line can be accommodated subject to the satisfaction of the tests. Well, very good. And, and I was very proud to be part of the, the group that walked around and did the neighborhood inspection as we did last year. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, as we go forward, we can look at stable neighborhoods and maintain this policy. Uh, I, I realize that when people come to Oakville, they see the property, they see a wartime home, they realize, okay, this may not be big enough for my needs, I can knock it down and build what I want. But, but I'm, and I'm gonna use actually an example from a, a gentleman that um, is in IT right now. He, he knocked down his entire home, rebuilt it to look like the exact same home that was there before, but it was completely digitally set up. So, um, and this is on, uh, I think, Sewell. 
Uh, he, uh, he, he has a beautiful home from the outside, looks like what it did back in the 1950s, but inside it is amazing. And hopefully we can convince people who want to build monster homes that um, you can do the same thing that you want. You can achieve the same goals of having a beautiful home. You just kind of have to pay attention to what's around you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Uh, the questions over here, Councillor O'Meara. I'm just wondering if we've um, if we've done sort of a, a hindsight stress test on this. So if, if we looked back at say the past 20, 30 applications and wondered what percentage of those would now qualify under our our new criteria, have we done sort of a okay? Here's what's come in and here's what what, what would have qualified. You, Mr. Mayor, yes, actually we've, we've started doing that uh, based on the last uh, Committee of Adjustment uh, round of applications, uh, but we haven't gone uh, much further yet, but that would be a, a good way to assess the, uh, the appropriateness of the bylaw as well. Okay, thank Mr. You. Simeone. Thank you, Your Worship, to the Councillor. I just want to add that we have um, looked at the past two years of applications and found out what the greatest uh, variants were where the variances were being mostly sought they're reflected on page I believe it's 46 of your report you'll see uh, an, an enumeration of, of certain criteria those are your tops of the hit parade in terms of variances we've gone back and looked at about 210 220 applications per year and then sifted it out from the residential character study to the zero suffix and then in there we started to look at the, the standard deviation from from the, the median as it were We've got rid of the outliers, and when you see the numbers there, that's the... Uh, so in addition to sort of forensically going back on the current applications, we've done some of the investigation over the last two years of the committee. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hutchins? Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, you'll be going back, talking to the people like the TCRA and potentially other resident associations. I've heard some comments from the TCRA that there's a section RL3-010 which has not yet been covered and I'm sure you're going to be looking into that when you go back to, to them. Through you Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, uh, uh, we'll be taking all the feedback that we have received and will receive uh, in considering all that. Uh, the way the bylaw is drafted today, the uh, the special provisions uh, of which you, the area that you speak of uh, is excluded from the bylaw, but uh, we'll be looking at uh, whether that's appropriate moving forward. Okay, well, thank you. As I say, I'd be happy to move it when the time comes. I believe we have delegations. Uh, and we have other councillors with interests. Um, is that only Councillor Liz Chenna? Councillor Liz Chenna. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Simeone. Uh, with respect to addition of the of this uh, draft LVCB with the four tests, do you um, anticipate a decrease in appeals to the LPAT as a result, given that there's more clarified cr criteria? Uh, through you, Your Worship, we would anticipate mm -hmm. potentially more compliance with municipal zoning standards. Otherwise, they may be looking at uh, a, a an appeal which may not be successful. I mean, my understanding that all of the criteria would have to be answered in the affirmative, and clearly if you've exceeded numerically, it's hard for me to understand how that would be seen in an affirmative way. But um, there's always a zoning option for people that think that they still have a need to go forward. So we might see a shift in some applications, we might see more of a compliance, and we might see some more zonings and call them major variances. Any other members of council with questions? Madam Clerk, uh, would you call the registered delegations, please? First delegation is Diana Kurd Trask from the West Harbors Residents Association. Welcome, Ms. Trask. Council is looking forward to your information. Once again, I'm Diana Gerd Trask, and I'm president of the West Harbor Residents Association. And now that I have read a few documents that I had not uh, seen before, one of them from Pamela Knight, uh, bringing up some of our concerns and listening to Mr. Simeone uh, ask for more time, I don't think it's appropriate for me to be addressing you at this stage. I'd like to see all the facts in front of me 
because some of the things they need to talk about will have been put down on paper and resolved. All I can say so far is that I have the, I'd like to commend the uh, um, Planning Services Department for their April 23rd, 2018 report because I could actually understand it. <laughs> so any of our <laughs> residents who were concerned would have no problem also. And that was very kind, well, well written. So I'd like to put my comments aside and move on with the meeting, if that's all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the next delegation. Ms. Morowitz, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you, Your Worship, Honorable Councillors, members of staff. I'm here this evening representing the Chartwell Maple Grove Residents Association, again. Um, as you're aware, we have been actively involved in providing input into the development of the Livable Oakville official plan and the current set of bylaws that affect stable residential communities such as ours. We've been strong advocates for reform and consistency in the process for consideration of minor variance applications. We are not opposed to development changes in our neighborhood. Uh, change is inevitable and we welcome the revitalization that it brings. That said, change in a stable residential community should be gradual and evolving and not drastic. Our current bylaws do not restrict change, but to maintain the character of our neighborhood, the degree of change needs to be better defined. Over the years, the minor variance application process has not functioned optimally, as there has always been a lack of clear direction and far too much leeway in interpretation of the bylaws. We commend town planning staff for taking a fresh approach on this issue. We are heartened by the proposed minor variance control bylaw, as it provides clear parameters that applicants can work within and good direction to the Committee of Adjustment. We would, however, like staff to consider the following concerns before implementing the bylaw in its current form. With, uh, these are specific issues that, we, uh, that our board has had with the report. I'm just going to briefly bring them up, but I'm sure we'll be dealing with them if we have some more time to have input as we go on, but I'll bring them up now. Uh, with respect to Table 3 and the request for variances in height, we would request that the height variance only be considered for a portion of the roof line, not the entire roof, allowing a variance about 10% of the roof will allow for architectural interest, but not overwhelming dominance. Our second issue relates to Schedule 1 and the definition of the assessment area. In much of our neighborhood, the lots are very large, and the 60-meter radius would not include many other dwellings, particularly when compared to zones where lot sizes are significantly smaller. Would it be possible to either increase the radius in the RL1-0 zones or require a minimum number of properties? and perhaps in that case allowing for more emphasis on consecutive adjacent and facing properties. Streetscape and neighborhood character is more accurately defined by the homes on your street as opposed to the ones behind you or around the corner. We ask that staff consider meeting with the residents associations again to discuss these issues and to consider making some changes in the proposed bylaw accordingly and it, as you mentioned it's important that we get this right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Morowitz. Are there questions for the leader of uh, Chartwood Maple Grove? Thank you very much for your, for your input. All right, uh, former, <laughs> but still interested. Madam Clerk, the next delegation. Chris, we seem to have a bad mic circuit. Um, the next delegation, the next listed delegation is uh, from Trafalgar Chartwell Residents Association, and we have Peter DeRosa and Linda Wilson Pauls. And we welcome you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, uh, thank you for the opportunity to delegate tonight. And um, I'd like to open by saying that some of the comments that have been, uh, we resonate with some of the comments that have been given so far from uh, our colleagues. Um, we also uh, want to acknowledge and uh, um, 
celebrate the, uh, the amount of interaction and uh, the work that the staff has done and the uh, participation that we, uh, we've given the opportunity to, um, to date. Uh, I brought with me uh, tonight Linda wilson Powells, who is a, um, a member of our board and responsible for this file. And she will take you through uh, a few slides to highlight maybe uh, one area of concern that we have in a recommendation. Thank you very much. Go ahead. We're just waiting for the slides. No problem. I'm we, just right behind you and I'll help you out with that, okay? Okay. Oh, we've oh, got it right here. Perfect. Someone's okay. right down in the back. Uh, so there we go. Just to switch it, you can just go down and it'll be the next slide. So down, down, down. Down. Okay. Mayor Burton, uh, councillors, and uh, town staff. First of all, I'd like to say what I'm about to present, there might be some mistakes in it. Uh, we have done our best in trying to understand this, and if that happens, I guess this is what we're meeting for, so that you can tell us if we're on the wrong track or the right track. So I would like to just address comments on lock coverage in this draft proposal. So as we understand it, the draft LVCB outlines two methods of determining a threshold for a minor variance lot coverage application. So how to determine, determine how to assess above the bylaw, how high to go. The first one I understand, or we understand the town data is from 2016 and 2017, and the other way of assessing uh, the amount is through local existing data. Sorry. So the variance threshold for lot coverage based on town data, it is our understanding that the town has averaged the 2016-2017 minor variance lot coverage approvals in the dash zero suffix zones in all of Oakville and determined the average increase to be 10%. And this is shown in table two of the draft bylaw. So 25% allotment could go up to 27.75. 30 to 32.70 and 35 to 37.8. The other way of assessing how much we could, uh, would be allowed as a threshold for lot coverage is to base it on local existing data. It is a local bylaw. <laughs> it is an all of Oakville bylaw. And it is our understanding that the town will consider a minor variance lot coverage to be based on the average of all properties within a radius of 60 meters and within the same zone as the applicant's property. The town planners would then use the lesser percentage of the two calculations to determine the acceptable minor variance above the bylaw for lot coverage. So it would be A, uh, the town's data over two years, or B, going right in and looking at the neighborhood and averaging uh, the lots in the neighborhood and, and the homes and what coverage they got. It is our opinion that the 10% increase, A, would almost always be the lesser amount. So 10% would uh, more than likely always win out. Using a 10% increase may disadvantage the long-time homeowner. A rebuild or expansion of their property may result in a smaller home than their neighbors, as their neighbors may have been allowed to build at a greater lot coverage. So this is just a little schematic I did. It's not in scale, but it shows how you might have someone who's lived in the area for 20 years and houses around them have gone up, but you are only going to, if, if the 10% is carried forward, that particular owner will only be able to go 10% higher than uh, the bylaw, whereas other people to the north and south and east and west of them might be much higher. So we're, the TCRA is recommending using only one type of data, that being the local existing data. Therefore, minor variance applications would be based only on the averages from homes in the same zone, across the street from me is another zone, so it has to stay in the same zone, within a 60 meter radius, which is the same radius used when you see an orange sign go up on a lot and a notice come through about a variance application. So those would be the homes. But we're also suggesting adding a point three, which is or 12 adjacent homes when lots are very large and a 60 meter radius only includes three, four, five homes. Now that could be uh, 12 homes or 15 homes. Uh, we just picked that figure. 
So those would be the three criteria. So when using the local existing data, homes in our established residential neighborhoods would grow gradually over time and they would reflect the established neighborhood that they're dealing with. We have many neighborhoods, some of them have oversized homes on them, but the average would, uh, would come down, not every, not every block in every neighborhood is full of oversized homes. Overbuilding has occurred in our city. So the last point that we would like to make from the TCRA, and it's been mentioned already, is that the draft LVCB uh, indicates that special provisions areas are, n and they're the ones that are designated by a superscript number, are not included in this bylaw. That's on page nine. We have a huge area in uh, TCRA's territory. It's RL 3-0 uh, special provisions 10. And it is the largest special provision area in all of Oakville. I did search the zoning bylaw document. Overbuilding has been prevalent in RL 3-010 for many years. And this area needs to be protected against overbuilding to maintain the character of this established neighborhood. And it at presently is excluded from the LVCB. Um, I'd like to just summarize. Uh, TCA, TCRA supports using only local existing data to determine the threshold for a minor variance lot coverage. The average would be taken from a 60 meter radius of 12 adjacent homes all in the same zone. And TCRA acts, asks the town to protect, protect our RL 3-0 SB10 zone from overbuilding. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to vo voice our ideas and our concerns on the draft LVCB. Thank you very much to TCRA for providing your advice and your information. Councillor Hutchins. Well, thank you for coming. I was thinking my microphone may have gone south with the mayor's, but it's here. Um, <clears throat> if uh, there's a park opposite or some other building that is there, how, how do you propose to modify the 60 meters? If someone, uh, or is, is 12 to 15 additional houses sufficient? Uh, the idea of uh, having a combination of uh, 60 meters or 12 homes is to accommodate. Mr. DeRosa, if, if you'd address the microphone, uh, people watching at home will know what you're saying. All right. If you want to keep it from them, they'll stay over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea of having a combined 60-meter uh, criteria along with uh, 12 homes is to accommodate the situation where you have larger lots, whereby the 60-meter does not bring in enough homes to uh, make a determination. So... Um, I think it's very necessary to, 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 to put that nuance into uh, the criteria because four or five homes will not determine. If 60 meters represents only four or five homes, that will not be sufficient to, to, um, to come to a decision. And uh, certainly the larger lots in East Oakville uh, where my colleagues uh, are um, would probably fall into that situation. So 12, is, is 12 the right number? Is 15 a better number? That can be determined uh, later, but I think it's important to put in that element. But, Councillor Hutchins, you're asking if there was a park there. Well, I think you just take the 60 meters a different direction, away from the park. I mean, you need homes to get the data to average from. I just wanted to know whether you'd go to 100 meters in that situation or, or uh, some combination. Uh, no, clearly, clearly the number of homes would, would, would have to be a, a representative number uh, that is encompassed by the 60 meters. So if you have a, an empty area and you end up with only four or five homes, that would be the trigger to, to go to the other, to the number of homes. Thank you. Any other questions for the delegation? Councillor Giddings. Actually, Mr. Mayor, it, it's a question for staff, uh, a concern that was brought up. So I'll, if anyone else has a question. Any other questions for the delegation? 
Thank you very much for your information. Thank you. Councillor Giddings, you have a question? Yeah, for staff, uh, the representatives from the TCRA talked about uh, that the LVCB isn't included in the uh, specific suffix they were talking about for the TCRA. Could you comment on that one, that concern? Mr. Planning Director. Thank you, Your Worship, to the councillor. So that area's got a special provision supplied to it. It's, it's unique. Um, the thinking being, uh, so on the ground, you're zoned for 19%, but in most cases, people have a little bit higher than that, 20, 25, 26, 24. So 19 <laughs> might be the minority in terms of what's actually built on the ground. Um, the thinking being by the exemption, we, they would be subject to the traditional four tests under the Planning Act, and there would be some opportunity through that process to bring in what's appropriate by virtue of assessing what's around it in, in a similar fashion without uh, specifically applying the test. As I understand it here, there might be some impact in a negative way and artificially lowering some people who wanted to perhaps add on or, or make their homes bigger. So that was the thinking at this point. But again, we're at the public meeting stage. We're still listening to everything. And that will continue to be looked at over the ensuing months. Yes, absolutely. That's our intention. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Madam Clerk, the next delegation, please. Next delegation is Janet Hazlett Thiel from Joshua Creek Residents Association. Ms. Hazlett Thiel, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Good evening, as noted. Uh, my name is Janet Hazlett Thiel. I'm the past president of the Joshua Creek Residents Association, and I'm a current director, um, and I'm here on behalf of the board. Um, so let me say that um, my colleagues in uh, the residents associations across the ward have done an excellent job, so I'll try not to be too repetitive, but a lot of people put a lot of hard work into this, so I feel like I should share it. Um, first, thanks to the town's planning staff for their effort to address the concerns we've routinely raised in regards to minor variances. As everyone knows and has commented, infill, renovations, rebuilding can have a considerable impact on the character of a stable a residential neighborhood like uh, our ward. That said, we do recognize that neighborhoods evolve over time and how they evolve is what is at stake in these discussions. The Planning Service Department report uh, on the matter, it's comprehensive, it's given us lots to consider um, and we appreciate the chance to delegate tonight and want the opportunity, as has been suggested by Director Simeone, to have further dialogue um, based on our comments tonight. We also want to take the opportunity to reinforce that we believe the town's residential character study is an important component and piece of this overall solution, and it should not get forgotten in the details of this new bylaw. JCRA is supportive of the report being accepted, but we believe uh, that the consultation needs to be more fulsome and the assessment uh, go deeper. It's important that we do get it right, um, and while I've often been up here saying, let's go, let's go, I am actually saying, let's slow down, let's have more thought and consideration, um, let's not create a whole new set of issues by rushing this. So in summer, we, we uh, encourage the town to take a measured approach on this. So when we looked at the local variance criteria bylaw, we were trying to balance that ever important protect the character of our stable residential neighborhood, but also the right of a resident to build on their property. And that means ensuring that the existing residents on streets that have already evolved, that already got approvals, um, and at times quite excessive approvals, that that single owner, as, as appropriately pointed out by TCRA, is not restricted to a lesser number than the current average of what their new streetscape is um, and their new character of their neighborhood is. It, it lowers their property value, it impacts their ability to make improvements, and all because of the wording of the bylaw. So overall, we agree with the variance types that have been chosen to be addressed. Um, we agree in general with the exemptions, though we are supportive of, of the need to, to look at that, why the special provision uh, should be exempt uh, as, as appropriately articulated by TCRA. Minor variances have been problematic in the past, um, and part of that process, uh, that lack of process to require applicants to justify the demonstrated need for a variance versus a desire for a variance is something that's always concerned us. So calling out exemptions is going in the right direction. 
Some other key areas of the, of the report that we believe need more consideration. The report and the draft bylaw lay out an approach that the criteria shall be, quote, the lesser of an average of properties found in an assessment area or the corresponding ma maximum in the bylaw, unquote. Our concern is that the percentage increases allowable over the zoning bylaws in several of the tables are quite high. For example, the maximum permitted lot coverage is approximately 10% over the zoning bylaw. We would argue that that is a key variable related to massing of the homes, monster homes, as Councillor uh, Grant pointed out, and that lot coverage should be maintained at less than 10% over the zoning bylaw. To address this, we would ask that consideration be given to changing the bylaw in the following way. One, reduce some of the overage percentages that are allowed, and two, change the wording to be either to be, quote, either versus the le lesser of. So in effect, the bylaw might read, quote, the maximum permitted lot coverage shall be either the average of the lot coverage determined for all properties found within the assessment area or up to the corresponding maximum lot coverage as set out. But obviously, we're asking that those numbers be lower. We believe that using the phrase either versus the lesser of is a more balanced approach and will still achieve the desired results of the new bylaw. Allowing, some other comments, allowing a maximum permitted height of 9.63 metres versus the current bylaw of 9 metres does seem to be out of place. It's become a de facto rule in the current Committee of Adjustment that any submission over 9 metre heights is scrutinised and few height variances are approved. We wonder why the town is willing to sacrifice this critical criteria and minor variances now with the new bylaw. And so we, uh, we concur a bit with where CMGRA was at, whereas if it's a minor amount where it's an architectural feature, um, that might be considered, but the numbers they're talking about, 9.63, are quite high. Um, we think there should be greater discussion on uh, the rear yard setbacks as well. Some of them are as high as 15%, um, and, and, and we want to just make sure that those numbers line up with respecting the character of the neighbourhood. The definition of the assessment area, as others have pointed out, needs to, uh, we need to look more closely at that 60 meter radius. And we, we would like to add the words adjacent and abutting homes um, to whatever wording is there. Because what's adjacent and abutting to you really does start to reflect the character, which is really what we're trying to get at, is protect and reflect the character of the neighborhood when you're assessing a minor variance. And finally, we'd like to just have a further dialogue um, overall in terms of what are the, what are the impacts of making these cha this change um, and, and directionally where we're headed. I want to thank our colleagues at the other residents' associations. We've had some offline discussions that have been very helpful to formulating our, uh, our thoughts. We're very appreciative of the suggestion of Do uh, Director Simeone in regards to uh, taking some additional time and we, as always, look forward to participating in the discussion um, and seeing it move forward. Thank you, Ms. Hazlitt. The old questions, Councillor Duddick. Thank you. Not so much a question, just a comment. Thank you so much for raising the issue of the rear of the properties because it seems to be more and more it's the the um, the footprint in its entirety versus just the front streetscaping. So thank you for raising that. We agree. Thank you very much for your information. Are there other members of the public with information for Council on this matter? Council is there? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Cox. Welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you, Your Worship. I, uh, I actually didn't register, and I apologize for uh, the late submission of, uh, of comments. I sub submitted a report about 3 o'clock this afternoon, I guess. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. Probably not. Um, and just so you know, I'm here representing myself and myself only. I'm a member of the Con Cornelia Park Resident Association. And just to kind of fill you in what's happened, Pam has submitted her report. I submitted my report. We, we decided to take different approaches. Pam took a broader approach to the issue of the LVCB and how it fits in with the perspective of the, of the residential policy review and COA in general. I've taken the approach of 
the, uh, addressing the specifics within the bylaw itself, and we thought it would be best to have two separate reports rather than trying to put them together and, and compromise. So we wanted to give two specific inputs so the folks could look at it. Okay, a lot of what I've got in the report, uh, my report has been said, so I'm going to, going to spare you that. There are a couple of things I would like to bring attention to that I don't think have been mentioned. Um, in the March uh, 19th, uh, 2018 Committee of Adjustment Options Report, which was presented to Council, uh, there is some very instructive language in there regarding reasons for an applicant to submit a request for a bylaw variance. Uh, these reasons are highlighted in four bullets on page 1011 of the report, and essentially they state that a minor variance is to provide relief where the physical characteristics or nature of the property is such that the full capabilities permitted in the bylaw cannot be achieved. Those are my words. That's not what's in the report. But after reading through it, that's what I got out of it. I talked to the planner, and they, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what it says. Um, the other reasons stated are accessibility needs and as-built conditions. So those are essentially it. So in effect, if you have a series of physical conditions in the property that pre prevent getting the full 25% lock coverage or whatever, then that's a good reason to have a, a variance. Um, a bylaw with respect to, yeah. Uh, what we believe is uh, this, this statement, which is silent in this new version, should, should be resurrected because we think it's important to identify the reasons for requesting a variance. That's a request. Uh, and the applicant should have to demonstrate why the development cannot be completed within the bylaw limitations before applying the bylaw criteria limits. Uh, and, and demonstrating that it's not possible to fully comply, uh, then the variance limits would apply. What we're really talking about, as mentioned by uh, Councillor Giddings, is we're having small homes replaced by big homes. So essentially, that's, that's really the issue we're addressing. And we have situations where some of these lots may be considered to be in the unusual category because according to this document as we read it, unusual could be a uh, unique uh, shape, uh, something about the size, some physical condition that would prevent applying the criteria of the, the bylaw, uh, cr yeah, the bylaw criteria. Um, the, there are several exceptions considered to be unusual and uh, we have concern that or I have concern that the word unusual is really not defined in the bylaw and, and has the potential to, be, have the, to have the same connotation as the word minor. What's unusual? Who's going to define unusual? Uh, we have a situation in our neighborhood right now where there's a a lot that has been sold, a thousand square foot uh, house on it, 50 years old, it's going to be rebuilt, no doubt. It's a trapezoidal shape. It's unusual in terms of the area, but so does that thing get exemption? So we'd be concerned about having that in, 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 in there. Um, let's see, I got another point here. I'm just trying to jump over this so I don't uh, don't repeat it. Oh yes, um, what we would what I would suggest is that if the unusual so-called unusual property can be fully developed to the extent of the bylaw, in other words, you can achieve a 25% lot coverage, then the uh, limits should uh, it should not uh, the sorry the L, the the variance criteria bylaw should not apply. In other words, there's no need to exempt that property if it can be developed to the limit of the bylaw. So that's something we'd like to have, or we suggest be considered. Uh, just to support Mr. Councillor O'Meara in communi uh, communicating this uh, bylaw proposal, it would be very helpful if there was better understanding of the data that went in the data analysis that happened to, to develop the various criteria limits because I think it's very difficult for people to understand how you arrive at a 9%, a 10%, or 11%. And is that data skewed to particular parts of the town or is it skewed uh, towards the just missing the bylaw to a, a very large uh, overage of the bylaw? Are there breakage in the data? They're, in analyzing that data, it may point out uh, and support communicating with the uh, greater uh, audience and the residents just why these, these numbers have been selected. 
I think that's about all I will comment on now, uh, but I will, um, and I, I wish to thank very much the uh, planning department, particularly uh, um, Mark Simeone. I think they've done a tremendous job on this. This is really required. And like the other, other uh, delegates have said, uh, we really do want to get this right, and let's proceed judiciously. Thank you very much oh. for your information, sir. Um, I did read your letter. I thought it was good. And you, you followed it faithfully. Councillor Duddock. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, and uh, I did appreciate getting it uh, late in the afternoon, but nonetheless, it was very much appreciated. I'm glad you raised the point as to the justification for the increase, because I think that hits on the nub of the question I hear time and time again from residents. If our new zoning bylaw has increased the amount that they can uh, build on a property, why do they have to go beyond that? What is the glaring reason for it? Mm -hmm. So I think your point's well taken because a lot of times people say, why could you not have accomplished that in the new uh, zoning bylaw? It's a given that people are just going beyond. So thank you. Yeah, the suggestion is it should be based on need, not on want. Totally. And justified. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, is that, I guess I've called for extras. Are there any more extras? All right, uh, Council, a motion to receive from Councillor Duddock. Um, Mr. Simeone, um, are you making note that um, the, uh, I know you'd, in your report, you'd already captured the desire for clarity of terms and, and Mr. Cox uh, tax, uh, tasked you on the term unusual. Uh, and uh, council and delegations have asked you to add some consideration of uh, the need to provide reasons. Uh, you may have um, actually, uh, since you initiated that idea, you may have you may have some professional reason why it fell out of the equation. But but in the final report, let's certainly make sure that you address it. And did I miss anything else? No, your worship, you did not. I took. Sorry, took extension, extensive notes, and we have, I believe we're going to be on the same page. I've right. noted that these are from the residents. Uh, normally, I'm tracking council's comments, but I think we can assume that they're, they're going to be the same on this one. All right. So uh, the motion is that the comments from the public with respect to the town-initiated local variance criteria bylaw be received, and that analysis proceed to take account of these things. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that is carried. Thank you, everybody. Now, um, the next is the, uh, if you give your attention to Leslie Gilwood, she is going to summarize for the public the public meeting and recommendation report for the town-initiated official plan amendments uh, that implement the active transportation master plan. And uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, interest in uh, commenting on this from members of the public. And I would just caution that comments on the official plan amendment are in order. The active transportation master plan was adopted quite some time ago and is subject to future review, but it can't be changed by, um, uh, there, there's no way to change it through the official plan amendment process. And so I would ask uh, delegates, uh, to confine themselves to the matter that's before us, which is the official plan amendment. Leslie Gilwood, we are ready for your summary for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Burton and members of council. Good evening. And thank you for that introduction. I'm here to speak about item number four on page 63 of tonight's agenda. This is a statutory public meeting to receive comments from the public about three proposed official plan amendments to implement the townwide active transportation network from the 2017 active transportation master plan update. Just so we're on the same page, active transportation or human powered travel, most often by foot or bicycle, is encouraged by provincial, regional and local policies. The provincial policy statement and growth plan require municipalities to plan for it, promote it, and provide infrastructure that supports it. Schedule D to the Livable Oakville Plan is based on the active transportation network from the 2009 active transportation master plan 
and it applies to the livable Oakville plan area only. Since 2009, a regional active transportation master plan has been approved, and as the mayor mentioned, last year the town's 2017 active transportation master plan update was approved. The proposed active transportation facilities included in the, in the 2017 ATMP update were determined through that project, and the technical analysis and stakeholder input are described in the report from the Engineering and Construction Department to this council last July. Based on Council's approval of the 2017 ATMP update, budgeting and planning for the provision of those facilities is proceeding. The purpose of the proposed OPA 28 to the Livable Oakville Plan is to update Schedule D based on the mapping from the final 2017 ATMP update completed last November. OPA 28 replaces Schedule D with this new town-wide map that shows existing and planned active transportation facilities such as bike lanes, bike routes, and multi-use trails. The purpose of OPAs 319 and 320 are to add text to the North Oakville East and West Secondary Plans to reference this town-wide map in the Livable Oakville Plan and to indicate where there are any conflicts that the North Oakville uh, Secondary Plan policies uh, would prevail. That's it really. Because of the limited scope and technical nature of these amendments, staff is recommending that they be approved for the reasons outlined in the staff report. It is also recommended um, that the bylaws to adopt the OPAs on pages 311 through 330 of tonight's agenda be passed. And finally, that the notice of council's decision reflects that council has fully considered and appropriately addressed all of the submissions relating to this matter. That concludes my presentation. Our sustainable, uh, excuse me, our sustainable transportation program coordinator, Chris, Chris Clapham, and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Councillor. Are there questions? Madam Clerk, would you call the uh, first delegation? First delegation is Fraser Dunlop from Cycle Oakville. Welcome, Mr. DeMoff. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can we get the presentation pulled up? Oh. And which one is yours? The cycle of the... Uh, it's item number four, right? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, so thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight. And uh, just before I begin, I do uh, want to uh, congratulate and uh, first time delegating in front of Councillor Longo. So uh, welcome to the group and congratulations. Um, in general, we're uh, Cycle Oakville is supportive of uh, obviously updating the OPA t or the uh, official plan to be um, in line with the feedback that we provided last summer. Um, I did want to draw a few things to the council that we have co some concerns with in general, um, but they do relate uh, to, uh, to our general support for uh, passing this amendment tonight. Uh, so uh, just a background on Cycle Oakville, who we are, we're a leading advocacy organization trying to get more people, uh, part of the modal shift out of their cars into other modes of uh, transportation. We organize social rides. We'd love if some of our councillors and even the mayor yourself, if you'd like to join us at one of them, to, to try and experience Oakville on wheels uh, instead of, or on two wheels instead of four. Um, our board of directors and membership is made up of cyclists from all over Oakville um, and, uh, and cyclists of, of all ranges, those that ride to work and those that uh, ride for sport. Uh, the cycling in Oakville uh, can be dangerous and I, I wanted to at least draw attention to the ghost bike at third line and Lakeshore is something that we uh, should always be kind of conscious of as we're making the decisions like we are tonight. Uh, so 
it, as you can see here, um, and this was pulled right from the ATMP that we passed la or that you passed last summer. Uh, one of the uh, the big things that the community wants to see and and, and certainly uh, would be appreciative of and, and like seeing is the in boulevard trails, <laughs> off road trails, and the buffered bike lanes. Unfortunately, um, as you can see in sta in the staff uh, map that you'll be voting on this evening. Uh, in North Oakville, a large portion of what's being planned is signed bike routes. And as you can see from the top left here, the infrastructure on the road hasn't changed at all other than a sign uh, being put up. Mr. Demoff, could you focus on the matter that's before council, which is the OPA? Uh, we, we are eager to know if you're in support of the OPA or if you'd like us to not adopt the OPA. No, in, in general, we're supportive of updating the previous map that was there. Uh, but I think it's important for us to at least draw attention to some of the issues that exist, especially since there's been new councillors that have been added to this council since the last ATMP was updated. So you're not interested in focusing on the matter at hand? No, we are focusing on the matter at hand. In our, in, in, in our opinion, you can't look at this map without focusing on some of the, uh, the issues that exist within it. Continue, Mr. DeMoss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so one of the big issues that we have that we communicated to yourself uh, and to Council is that even with this map, our GO stations still remain heavily islanded, uh, accessible only uh, or mainly via, via automobile. automobile. Uh, we have a heavy use of sharrows and bike route signage uh, instead of safe infrastructure like buffered bike lanes and in boulevard trails. And as congestion continues to be an issue, uh, like I said, it's really important for us to focus on this modal shift of getting people out of their cars and into other forms of transportation. So in terms of the Schedule D map in, in front of you tonight, some of the things that uh, are still an issue uh, is a connection between the six line bike lanes and the Spears and Queen Mary plans uh, that are in place now. Uh, the Crosstown Trail is still somewhat fragmented. Lakeshore Road still needs end-to-end uh, -end safe infrastructure and uh, buffered bike lanes still aren't planned to be installed at Oakville GO Station until 2025, which is, uh, if in my count, three elections away from now. In terms of Oakville's ATMP funding, uh, we have a serious issue with the fact that the money received by uh, the Ontario Municipal Cycling Commuter Program uh, replaced uh, town funding instead of adding to funding that was supposed to be going to uh, active transportation. And Mr. Mayor, you seem like you have a comment. You want to jump in? I have no comment. I'm just waiting to hear you be relevant. Yeah. So the, um, the infrastructure currently built certainly is not always bike friendly. And um, so it's something that it, when, we're, when we're passing things like uh, the map tonight, we do need to kind of keep in, in mind. Um, and certainly one thing I've already mentioned that the signed bike routes on uh, entire subdivisions north of Dundas is a bit of a failed opportunity since these, a lot of these subdivisions aren't even built yet and we're only planning to do signed bike routes. So uh, I know it certainly wasn't relevant to you, Mr. Mayor, but to the uh, many members in attendance tonight and certainly the cycling uh, community, we take this very seriously and we, we do ask you to uh, to, to pass this uh, amendment, uh, but to just keep in mind the context for what this decision means for the people that actually will be uh, riding on, uh, on Oakville Roads. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMoff. I hope that your group will remember that the Transportation Master Plan and the Active Transportation Master Plan are regularly reviewed, and uh, uh, in my estimation, we've been uh, adjusting it towards your demands uh, uh, or your requests and your advice, and uh, I hope you can at least be happy with that. Yeah, and I, th I think one of the um, the big things we're looking for is that if you look at cycling the same way you do at recreation facilities, the amount of hours uh, that are spent at those facilities and the amount of money associated with that, when you look at the provincial average for Oakville, we are underfunding, and so we would like that to be kind of matched. Thank you. Thanks. Madam Clerk, the next delegation, please. The next delegation is Dr. Edna Tullock-King. Ms. Tullock-King, welcome. Council, I, I need to ask, do you have information to share with us about this file? Uh, yes. Please, can, please begin. Thank you, sir. I am very happy that we are here. And it has enlivened my husband. Two things. One is that 
I have heard no comments about the economic uh, or monetary values and decision making. The next thing that uh, strikes me is that we have seemed to have an excellent report and planning, but is void of the, uh, the, 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 the person to person or spiritual multi-racial, multicultural thing that guides every discussion. Ms. Tullet King, we I, are, I, excuse me, we are considering an official plan amendment that will implement the active transportation master plan. Do you have a comment on the official plan amendment? Yes, I have. That's what I'm saying, that it is excellent. But when you put a plan, we have to think who pays for it? How does things like taxation uh, influence it? That's what I'm saying. The next thing, I have not heard any comment about it, and it doesn't fix the operation and personal reaction to the plan, is that uh, the experiential, that is, putting it on paper is okay, uh, but in terms of what that means to uh, life, for example, the, uh, the, the last report, for, to life safety, and what we actually have on the ground, I was very instrumental, I was very attracted to his response to what is happening on Lakeshore. Because Lakeshore looks good, and I admire it, but he says that internally there are certain structures that are not safe. And it's because of the area, who use the area, and people actually, what happens to that area? Why are people using uh, Lakeshore? What I'm saying to you is something that is very difficult, except you have actually been in the planning. And see, so I say you can run a mile if you eat well, if you uh, rest, and et cetera, et cetera. But you can do all those things except the person or the material or the money that goes into it. I'm sorry, I can't explain it anymore. What I'm thinking is, can I say generally, it's an excellent plan. If you read it academically, it's excellent, but it is not working. And this is why we are having the reaction in the regions. And I could give you a very personal thing. Until now, I have been, my husband and I, have been suspended from the caravan program. And we have, uh, they said they sent us a letter to, to report, to, to explain to us. I have not yet got it. So it's an excellent plan. Caravan, wonderful. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edna King. Ms. Tullet King. I, I could say more. And it, you see, sir, due respect, when you asked us if we needed help to go, I say yes. Okay. I went out to see. When, you, when you're ready for help, you let me know and I'll arrange it. My husband is not leaving. Would you like he to go now? Here when you are finished. Would you, you. Now? Yeah. Are you asking for help now? Just yes or no? Clarence, His Excellency, Mayor, speaking to you. Are you ready for help now, or you want to read? He's shaking his head. He wants to listen. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Um, any other members of the public with information for council, hopefully on the official plan amendment? Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself for the clerk and share your information. It's uh, Melvin Meisner, and I'm not... This is a, a sort of an overview of what you're up against. So and just uh, because I tried to get into the amendment and I'm not sure whether it, it, it really takes a look at the, uh, the uh, way a cyclist should be doing. Look, at, I was concerned like the person that killed the uh, Oakville cyclist last in, in 216 is being sentenced on May 30th. You know, that tr cyclist was traveling 
uh, west on Lakeshore, and was and just to remind you, was struck from behind just before the intersection on the east side of Third Line. The SUV driving admitted that uh, the cyclist had 200 meters of uh, 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 he had he could see the cy cyclist 200 meters away, and it was a dry, clear, sunny day. Now, bike lanes are present on both sides of Lakeshore West, going going from uh, uh, the third line to Bronte. Um, however, no such bike lanes ex exist going east from third line towards Kerr Street. Uh, unfortunately, that cyclist died just a few meters and a few seconds away from a, a safer roadway. Had the cyclist reached the ba bike lane on the west side of the intersection, he may, may not have died. Today, a white, you know, as we mentioned, a, that white memorial, memorial bike uh, uh, ma uh, marks the spot. So a better system of east-west uh, north-south bike lanes in Oakville would make it safer. Now, just some of the problems you get into. Now, both bike lanes and road services are in, uh, within Oakville are inconsistent. On a road with poor right-hand uh, uh, surface that is damaged or missing, the cyclist should ride in the path uh, generally of the right wheel uh, of the uh, a motor vehicle, uh, ensuring that not to hit a pothole or rough surface because an emergency maneuver to swerve is not an option. Sir, if the road could is, you, yeah. is there any chance you could focus your remarks on the no, official plan this amendment? Is, this is what I wanted, wanted you to be aware of because from your comments at the Joshua Ratepayers Association meeting, I didn't think you had an appreciation of all this. And so that I think, may or may not I be think, true, but I think I think that you uh, the the council should be aware of the difficulties that you have cycling, and that's what I'm going to address. And if you haven't put that into your amendment, maybe you shouldn't approve it until you do put it into your amendment. You're so wasting my time. The well, it remains to be seen who's wasting what here. The official plan amendment before us implements the active transportation master plan which was adopted last year. Yes, I know. This, this process can't change that. Yeah, but you have to, when you're approving something, you have to be aware of the difficulties that are, are going on with cyclists. We actually are aware. Okay, let me, let me proceed then. Would you like us to pass or refuse the amendment before us? You can pass it, sure. Thank you. Uh, please share your other information. I just said that, uh, okay, we talked about the, the right-hand side lanes. If, the, if, it's, if it's really rough in your potholes, you really just have to move over uh, to the track that a right wheel of a car would take. This isn't going to take too long. And at uh, stop signs or uh, stop lights, without, without a bike line, the cyclist should move to the center of the road to prevent the cyclist from being trapped between the car and the curb and particularly on right-hand lane when the cyclist is tending to proceed straight through and the car is going to, and a car is, might be intending to make a right-hand turn. Not only is the right-hand turning is a problem, but a vehicle turning left in front of the cyclist who's going straight, and, for, and the cyclist going straight through causes an immediate danger, so, you know, without bike lanes. When a vehicle is, uh, particularly a truck, is too close, not only does it is scary and dangerous, but the turbulence can cause the bike to wobble, veer to the left into the path of an oncoming, you know, the following vehicle. On a roadway with parked cars, for example, and this happened to my daughter, where they opened the door, and this is a downtown Oakville, uh, the cyclist, uh, cyclist should ride far enough into the uh, street to avoid the door from opening. Like she suffered a concussion and went to the hospital and a gash, she still got the scars on her leg. The town should ensure that uh, and avoid planting trees to, uh, that would, uh, not, uh, that would uh, complicate the uh, uh, development of uh, you know, you know, ut trees and utility poles that would uh, complicate the development of future you know, bike lanes. And uh, so what, really what is needed is a system of northwest a grid, northwest, east-west uh, grids so you, you can accommodate cyclists. And because uh, not all drivers expect, expect respect the right of way of uh, a cyclist and uh, even though you share the same road and uh, under the same traffic laws. So uh, 
and there's a lot of instances, in, uh, numerous instances in Oakville where you could improve the ro road shoulders because the red roadbed is there. It just has to be improved and paved. And so as more people are now are biking in Oakville, uh, the, you know, the town should develop an excellent infrastructure as to support the environment and fitness. And Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you will uh, participate in the next review of the Active Transportation Master Plan. And, uh, and I was very glad to hear you acknowledge that uh, the drivers of bicycles and cars are required by law to share the road. And you did read several of the rules of the road that are in the Highway uh, Act for how that's supposed to be done. So thank you very much for that. Well, if somebody hasn't been cycling, uh, we can go out and cycle and you can, you can see the difficulties that you get into. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else with information for council on the official plan amendment? A member of council wants to move the, Councillor Hutchins, any discussion? All in favor? And the amendment is adopted. The next discussion item is the recommendation report, the zoning bylaw amendment for Bellier Developments at 2311, 2319, and 2323 Bellier Street. And we have a presentation from Melissa Darrymple who will reprise the report that council you've studied, I know, and that way the public at home and in the audience will be able to be up to date. Thank you, Mayor Burton and members of council. This presentation will provide an overview of the recommendation report, which can be found on page 87 of tonight's agenda. The subject lands are located on the north side of Bellier Street, east of Nelson Street, within a larger parcel of land designated for medium density residential development. Lands to the east and the south front, that front Bellier Street are designated for low density residential uses, which currently consist of detached dwellings that range in height from 5.5 meters to 9.4 meters. Lands to the north and west that front Hickson Street and Nelson Street are designated for medium density uses, which currently consist of two-story apartments that range in height from 6.7 meters to 10.3 meters. The original application was to develop the site with 26 units, which included 23-story townhouse dwellings and six one-bedroom accessory rental units fronting onto a common element condominium road with one access point onto Bellier Street. In order to receive comments on the file, a circulation was undertaken to departments and agencies, a public information meeting was held, and a statutory public meeting was held on March 19th. As a result of staff and agency review, several issues were identified that required further consideration by the applicant. First off, the region of Halton raised concerns related to rental housing stock policies in the regional official plan, given that six existing rental apartment units that form part of the primary rental market were proposed to be removed and replaced with six accessory dwelling units. Planning staff also evaluated the original application in the context of the town's urban design policies and were of the opinion that changes were necessary to the proposed layout. Those changes included reorienting the proposed townhouse blocks so that buildings would frame and face Bellier, which would help contribute to the pedestrian environment and reinforce the character of the street. As well, we wanted to see a greater transition between the proposal and detached dwelling, the, de the detached dwelling that's located east of the site, including reorienting the proposed townhouse blocks, removal of balconies to improve privacy, and to provide a lower building height and larger building setbacks adjacent to the east property line. In addition, staff requested that the applicant revisit the location of visitor parking which was included along the frontage of Bellier Street and in other inconvenient locations. In addition to comments from staff and agencies, a wide range of comments were received from the members of the public. Generally, members of the public were supportive of the proposed change of use to townhouse dwellings, 
however, expressed concerns related to other matters, such as height, building design, site layout, particularly with respect to transition to the existing detached dwellings to the east and south, site engineering, traffic, and provision of parking. These concerns have been reviewed in the planning analysis section of the report, and additional responses to written comments have been included in Appendix D. In addition to comments raised by residents, members of Planning and Development Council approved a resolution that an analysis and response to the range of matters shown on this slide be included as part of the recommendation report. A detailed response has been included in Appendix F of the staff report. So as a result of the feedback provided to the applicant by town staff, the Region of Halton, members of the public, and Planning and Development Council, a revised design was submitted by the applicant for consideration. This is a 3D rendering of the revised application in context with the existing neighborhood. The revised application provides 22 townhouse units. To address comments related to streetscape, the townhouse blocks were reoriented to Front Bellier Street. To provide a better transition to the detached neighborhood to the east and south, the application has also been amended to show a lower building height of 10 meters for the units fronting Bellier Street and 10.8 meters for the balance of the site. Also, there are increased east side yard setbacks ranging from 1.2 meters up to 4 meters in the vicinity of the detached dwelling in this area. Balconies have also been removed from most of the units with the exception of units closest to the rear property line. Visitor parking has been minimized and centralized in the site. And to address the region's comments related to rental housing policy, the accessory dwelling units were removed and six of the units will be set aside as rental units that are part of the primary rental housing stock. And those units will be located in this block. The residential medium density land use designation permits a range of housing types including townhouses at a density of up to 50 units per hectare. The density of the proposed development falls within the permitted density range identified by Livable Oakville and therefore supports the town's overall urban structure. In addition, staff have evaluated the proposal in the context of section 1119 of Livable Oakville and are satisfied that the revised zoning bylaw amendment and related site layout are compatible with the neighborhood and that the existing neighborhood character will be maintained. The property is zoned RM4 Special Provision 75 by the zoning bylaw, and the existing zoning bylaw does not permit townhouse dwellings. To implement the proposed development, a new site-specific special provision for the subject lands is required, which will allow the proposed townhouse use and include site-specific performance standards, including increased east side yard setbacks and restricted building heights, which are further restricted along the street frontage. In addition, a holding provision will be applied to the site to ensure that the Region of Halton's requirement for an updated functional servicing report is addressed prior to redevelopment of the site. Although both the existing and proposed zoning are consistent with the PPS, conform with applicable provincial plans, and conform with the Region of Halton official plan and the Livable Oakville plan, Compared to the existing zoning, the proposed zoning would represent a more gradual transition between the, between the existing detached dwellings on Bellier and the apartments on Nelson and Hickson Street. The design of the proposed development will be further advanced through this site plan application, where items such as landscaping, tree preservation, architectural details, and matters related to the function of the site will be fully addressed. Staff is satisfied that the application is revised as consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to the growth plan and the Halton Region official plan, has regard for matters of provincial interest and represents good planning. Further, the application is consistent with the principles and overall policy direction of the Livable Oakville plan. Staff recommend approval of the zoning bylaw amendment as the requirements listed on this slide have been met. And in conclusion, staff put forth the following recommendation for council's consideration. Thank you very much Thank for you. that report. 
Uh, Council, do you have questions for the staff? Councilor Elgar. Thank you very much for the for the for the presentation. My concern is to do with minimum parking on surface. Um, is is do you, does the staff think that's a good thing? Because my concern is that what I'm having problems with right now is there is no parking spaces for, for a lot of other developments in Oakville where everybody has two vehicles. And I'm wondering, is, are these uh, townhouses, are they slab on grade? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, the townhouses are slab on grade. So the two parking spots per unit, one is the garage and the other is the driveway, I would assume? That's correct. So what, what is, and it's frustrating, but what has happened is that garage in many of these houses has become the basement storage area. So everybody, when they move in, they have one parking space. But then I noticed that you've minimized the parking of six units for visitor parking. Like, six units adequate for 22 uh, townhouses, in, in staff's opinion? The proposal meets the requirements of the zoning bylaw for parking for townhouse units. Um, so as you've said, there will be one occupant or resident spot in the garage, one on the driveway, and the 1119 of livable Oakville encourages that parking on site be minimized. A minimum number of visitor parking spaces that meets the requirements of the zoning bylaw has been met through this proposal. So if extra visitors come, more than six on any one night with a vehicle, uh, where would they park? Is it the surrounding streets? Is that the the idea? That they would need to... to comply with the town's overnight parking bylaws and any other applicable bylaws. Okay, because it, uh, in North Oakville, you can, I guess there are areas where you can park overnight, is my understanding, in some of the locations. But I'm wondering, we're not introducing this in South Oakville, are we? The idea of overnight parking, where you can pay to park? No, my understanding is that that's not available here. Okay, I thank you. That is a concern. I think we have a, a staff have been asked to come back with a report looking at revising the parking requirements. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We've had that request a number of times. We Thank you. I look, it that. seems to be a, it's a growing issue, I can tell you. Thanks. Councillor Noel, did I see your hand? You certainly did. Um, with respect to the, uh, um, the regional uh, conformity with respect to rental places, I'm curious how that works from a legal perspective. So um, they're going to devote six units for rental in return for removing rental accommodations. I understand that piece. How is how are we assured that they are going to remain remain in rental stock on a long term basis? Is it something restrictive covenant? Like how does that how does that work from a legal perspective? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the condominium application will set up a series of blocks and common elements. Um, let me bring up. So this shows you the proposed site plan. So these, this is the location of where the rental units will be located. And what will happen through the condominium application is this, instead of being hived off into individual parcels of tied land, it will be one larger parcel of tied land tied to this common element. What that means is that ownership will be transferred to one owner who then has the ability to rent out the units. If that owner ever tried in the future to sell off these units, he could sell them off to another owner interested in renting all six out. But these individual units wouldn't be, the ownership of those individual units wouldn't be transferable without an amendment to the condominium plan, which would require a further application with the town. So there would be a check and balance as to how those lots would be divided. It's interesting. And who would, is the, is the developer the, the, um, the, the landlord in this particular case? Would they be renting it or would they be selling it off to a third party? Or is that a question better for the applicant? That's a question for the applicant. Okay, thank you. Fascinating. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have uh, delegations <laughs> registered on this? Yes, we do. We have Scott Newland and Emilio Fabris registered. Welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you very much. 
Your Worship and Honorable Members of Town Council, I'd like to start by saying that we're opposed to the development on Bellia Street as proposed, uh, we're opposed to the development on Bellia Street as proposed in the addendum document. Um, with all due respect to the planners, we, we don't feel that it does fit into the character of the neighborhood. Um, while we appreciate that uh, they have addressed some of the concerns or significant concerns that were raised, there are still significant provisions of the Livable Oakville plan that we feel are not adequately remediated. Furthermore, we believe that this would be a precedent setting proposal that if successful, may be copied by other developers on connecting parcels of land, thereby destabilizing our neighborhoods. I, uh, I sent something to the, to the uh, town councillors today and I'm just gonna go through a few points that were some of the key reasons why we, we oppose this, um, this development. First one, the density we feel is still very high for the street. Although the, the planning uh, department indicated that it is, um, that is within the limits of the zoning density, which may be true, however, it doesn't incorporate the surrounding community, which is primarily single unit dwellings. The uh, previous design had 20 units, and they've actually increased that number to 22 units. Now they, the other one had 20 units with six, uh, I guess they're called accessory dwellings, uh, rental dwellings. Now they're actually 22 individual units. So they've increased the massing. Uh, we're, we're looking for a significant decrease on the number of units in order to be a favorable proposal. Uh, there are several driveways that will now be proposed to be on Debellier. This will detract from the streetscape and safety and add more uh, issues with garbage and other site planning issues. Uh, parking should be oriented to the rear of the units on Bellier. The third point is that there's still significant uh, parking concern with one spot available outside the garage as Councillor Elgar had, uh, had indicated most of the garages will be utilized for storage and and therefore, with two, two people in the household, they'll be more likely to be parking and be using the visitor spaces, not leaving spaces for, for visitors when they come. They'll be parking on the street. We, we all know that's going to happen. And, and based on uh, what we've seen in the, the town's bylaw guidance on section 5.2.1, it requires 25% of the required spaces to be provided in addition as visitor spaces, totaling 11 additional visitor spaces required for the proposal. This is uh, based on a condominium which has shared spaces that are required and, and the condominium board, which we're, we're unclear if this is be determined as a condominium, but uh, 11 additional spaces instead of the five, uh, five spaces they've indicated. The units at the back of the property have a mere 1.2 meter setback to the easternly uh, property, which is not just uh, the ones on Bellier, they're actually the properties on, on Hickson as well. <coughs> And, uh, and as well, they have a 12 meter height and when actually viewing that, uh, that 3D rendering, it was, it was quite evident how massive that this is going to be in, in respect to the rest of the properties. You could see everything else is significantly lower and you're basically just building up a, a big mass on Bellier Street. And uh, it will leave very, we also feel that the, the lack of um, space on the side of the property may leave little room for drainage and other uh, access to the back of the property as well as buffering as such as hedges or trees that might be required in order to, uh, to buffer these to the neighboring properties. And finally, um, with, with the lot coverage that has been proposed, there, there is very little uh, green space left with the driveways and road and, uh, and buildings themselves, not to mention people want a patio, et cetera. There will be virtually no space left for trees and for uh, you know, shared green space that will be used by the enjoyment for all the residents. Um, this may be more appropriate in, in an urban setting that is officially sanctioned as a growth area, but as we know, this is not considered a growth area for Oakville, and uh, it's, it's a stable, predominantly single dwelling street that, that we'll be losing virtually all the trees on the property, and, and it will you know, be replaced with massive blocks of buildings. And so that, that's... Uh, that's our concerns, and Emilio has some concerns as well. Good evening. Um, I live right next door to the east of the development, so um, there's, a, there's a couple concerns. I mean, the, the previous presentation um, 
about the minor variances that everyone's applying for. And so everyone had, you know, big concerns about uh, the consistency of urban, urban design, the setbacks, um, strengthening the livable Oakville plan, um, concerned with lowering property values because of these variances, et cetera. So, and, and a lot of considerations gone into that. And here we're dealing with not a minor variance, but a significant variance. So to the overall uh, street, I mean, um, not from the, the zoning in particular. I don't know if it's at all possible to consider when transitioning from singles to medium density, is it all possible to consider how the zoning set up where there's more consideration given to how it impacts the singles next door or you know, wherever the singles may be around this, uh, this new proposal. So setbacks, I understand a lot of the setbacks conform within the zoning, but at 1.2 meters, especially in the rear yard, where as a single home, that's where you're gonna be enjoying your summer, a 1.2 meters, sorry, 1.2 meter setback and a 30 foot wall beside you, that significantly impacts the enjoyment of the rear yard, not just of mine, but probably about three or four down the way with respect to shading, privacy, et cetera. So again, transitioning from single to medium, is it possible to perhaps increase those setbacks significantly? In this case, maybe take two units away from that rear yard. It's only two units out of 23 or so at this point. Um, I think it's still a win-win for everybody, but it doesn't significantly impact the residents right next door. Um, again, that would help solve some of the parking problem. That would help solve some of the green space problem where a huge row of tall trees can be planted all the way down the side, again, helping transition. Um, also, with respect to the roof heights, maybe the first two units, when adjacent to a single, maybe they'd be dropped down by a meter or two, whatever's reasonable, but just to help transition again from a single family up to the medium density. So I get that the region is pushing for um, more density, but I, I think it could be done a little bit more responsibly than what we're looking at. And this isn't horrible, but it could be done a lot better. And I don't know if, uh, if it's at all possible to do that at this point, but if it is possible, if someone can give that some serious consideration, that would be fantastic. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your information. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Madam Clerk, are, are, is there another delegation? Are there other members of the public with information for Council on this matter? If I may? Yes, sir. Please come up and introduce yourself for the clerks and share your information. My name's Steve Kernahan. Uh, I live directly across the street from this development. And uh, the main concern for myself and a couple of the other neighbors, I see Carol here, and uh, Karen wasn't able to make it, to, to make it today. But uh, our pr primary interest is um, having a development that is townhouses and individual owners rather than the current zoning for rentals. So I very much appreciate the concerns um, expressed by a couple neighbors here. I think that there's a lot of validity in those concerns. But at the end of the day, I just wanted to let you know that the, uh, there's are a number of neighbors that are absolutely it, firmly in support. It's best if you address us. <laughs> okay, sorry. We, we're, um, we're the ones who actually make the decisions. You got it. Just, just wanted to uh, express our support for the zoning change to turn this into uh, townhouses rather than sixplex of rentals. And that's all I had. Thank you very much for bringing your information. Thanks. I don't see anyone else. Mr. Simeone, uh, did uh, the first delegation present any new information that you had not dealt with in the application? Not, not, not in my view, Your Worship. So in your, your submission to council is that you've actually uh, given these issues they raised, the the, what you thought was the appropriate consideration? It is, in fact, yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Adams? Your Worship, I saw a hand wave when you pulled the audience one more time. Well, of all the people in the world, <laughs> Ms. Anderson, welcome. 
Um, Thank you, Your Worship. For whom Members are you appearing and what is your information? Yes, so I'm here this evening on behalf of, of the owners and I just wanted to summarize some responses through you to members of council uh, with respect to some of the issues raised and also some of the issues raised by the neighbors, if that would be helpful for council. I, I think the planning director's response was probably the more helpful, but okay. um, uh, if you think you can improve things, uh, sure. go right ahead. Um, just in response to um, Councillor Noel's question with respect to the rental and the ownership, we have had some discussions with staff and the region about this. Um, it is the intention for one of the owners who actually is in the business of rental housing to secure and maintain those, and we certainly look for those provisions through the site plan agreement. Um, I also did want to note in terms of uh, the driveway access, which I know is still an issue, um, that some of the neighbors have raised and in balancing all the interests in on the site um, We've looked at the driveways to provide that streetscape which does occur on Bellier rather than having uh, the blank facades um, In terms of the parking um, we do meet the minimum zoning requirements and uh, I would note that we do believe this is an urban context um, And in that regard we have implemented the RM1 zoning which with actual increased standards to ensure there's appropriate transition. So instead of the 1.2 meters, um, we've worked with staff to increase that to four meters to accommodate a spatial separation. We've also reduced the height from the existing, which is 15 down to 12, actually down to 10. So there are a number of elements that will provide for um, that response in terms of the concerns and the transition. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Well, thank you very much for appearing. Uh, what are you going to do to um, en enhance the likelihood that people will use their garages for cars? Well, I would say I encourage you to um, adopt the official plan amendment with respect to active transportation, which I think we need to do to encourage more, uh, less vehicle dependency and more active transportation, especially in this area of Bronte. Well, I uh, thank you. We already did that. <laughs> Councillor O'Meara. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. <coughs> All right, I think it's decision time. Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, uh, I will move the staff recommendations in the report, uh, and I do it understanding that it's a difficult decision for the, the members on the street. Um, I, I still think we've got some time to deal with some of the issues in site plan, be it uh, trees and garbage and a lot of that, uh, that other, uh, those other sort of secondary issues, grading, drainage, sewage, these sorts of things. So, um, so we, we still have another kick at the can to make sure we can do the best job we can at that street to make it look like, uh, like the street, like the Bellier that, that many of us, uh, including myself, live on. So I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that's carried and approved. Thank you. The uh, next item is the number six, the recommendation report uh, for the draft plan of condominium for 1502 Lakeshore Oakville Holdings, Inc. concerning 10 Maple Grove Road. And we have a presentation available from Lee Musson, and we have uh, at least one registered delegation. So it might be good to have the presentation. Lee, please and thank you. Thank you. Uh, this evening my report can be found on page 185 of your agenda. This is an application for a standard draft plan of condominium which has been submitted for four buildings, each containing three residential units for a total of 12 residential units. Condominium tenure would allow the transfer of the individual units from the developer to the future owners and the residential development at this time is currently under construction. The site is located at 10 Maple Grove Drive, and in 2014, the draft plan economy for phase one, which is to the east of the, of the subject lands, was registered, which had the effect of creating a total of 12 residential units within four buildings. Both phase one and the subject lands have entered into a shared facilities agreement which allows residents in both phases to have vehicular and pedestrian access as well as servicing between the two condominiums. The subject lands were sold to another developer who assumed all development obligations of the previous owner and of all the obligations within the minutes of settlement. A revised site plan for the subject lands was approved in December of 2016. This condominium consists of six buildings, each containing three residential units, 
giving a total of 12 residential units, which includes driveways, resident parking, and visitor parking. And again, the buildings are currently under construction. Access will be provided to these lands from Maple Grove Drive. Timing of the restoration of the existing heritage buildings is outlined within Schedule D of the Minutes of Settlement, which specifies the heritage features to be restored and refurbished prior to occupancy, and which features are to be restored and refurbished prior to registration of the condominium. These features, those features to be restored prior to registration of the condominium, as outlined within the Minutes of Settlement, are identified within the conditions of approval. The condominium does not include the waterfront lands since they are currently owned by the town. However, the waterfront trail um, has been improved by the applicant and they are actively working towards its completion with an anticipated opening to the public in mid-June. The Livable Oakville plan designates the land as low density residential special policy area in the Livable Oakville plan. There is also a site specific policy 27.2.11 which sets out the number of units on the site and design criteria. The proposal implements the Livable Oakville plan. The subject lands are currently zoned RL1 O suffix with a site specific zoning 305 which is a residential low density and N for natural area. The existing zoning regulations were established through a site specific zoning amendment to allow for the development of the lands. Staff um, are recommending that council approve this application. The draft plan of condo will legally create the individual units to allow for the transfer to the future purchasers. The subject site was subject to a detailed site plan process which reviewed a number of technical issues including built form, site layout, uh, access and parking, landscaping and urban design was also addressed, stormwater management, grading, drainage and servicing. A full circulation has been undertaken and there are no outstanding financial, legal or planning issues to be resolved. Building permits have been issued in accordance with the approved site plan. The application conforms to the livable local plan and as such, as such staff put forward the following recommendation. Thank you very much for a very welcome report. This has been a long running and star crossed property and it's delightful to have the end in view and a June opening of a much anticipated waterfront trail section. Uh, the registered delegation has left. I know of no others interested in sharing information with council. Um, we have a gentleman rising to approach to confound that statement. Sir? With your permission, uh, your worship, my name is Alan Bust, B-U-I-S-T. I'm the solicitor for the applicant. I wonder if I can just take one minute of your time to provide two items of clarification having to do with uh, matters of communication that we've had with planning staff and legal staff uh, on the conditions that are before you. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, very quickly, I, I direct your attention to condition 10 of Appendix A attached to the report. Uh, just for, for an abundance of clarity, uh, I was able to speak uh, directly with, with Lay and with, uh, with Ryan Maynard of Legal Services to clarify when uh, the word access is used in condition 10 about the removal of all legal access, that, that access only refers to vehicular access. That there's, that, that doesn't, there's no intention with that condition to restrict any pedestrian access through the existing gates from the site out to Lakeshore. So I thank uh, Lee and, and, Ray, or, and um, uh, <clears throat> Ryan for that clarification. With respect to, to uh, condition eight attached to uh, Appendix A, I just wanted to give clarification well that that uh, confirmation with respect to the existing easements uh, has already been provided to legal services and they've indicated that they're so satisfied with it for this purposes of clearing the condition. If I could, uh, Your Worship, I'd just like to acknowledge Lay. She's been wonderful throughout this process. You've indicated it's been a star-crossed development very unique from the very beginning and not only on this application but on all the different pieces of this we've been deeply appreciative of her competence and care so thank you for that Lee on behalf of uh, the applicant as well subject to any questions thank you for the time well it does go back a few years Agreed. thank you very much for your information staff do you have any uh, uh, changes you want to make as a result of the information provided mr. Carr I think I look at you for that I don't think uh, any changes are required, sir. And yeah, as far as the early satisfaction of one of the conditions, congratulations, Mazel Tov, and keep going. Um,
Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd be happy to move the staff recommendation. Well, I know that Mrs. Mayor is going to be happy with this too. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? And that is carried and approved at last. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we now turn to item number seven, the recommendation report for the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision for Oakville Investments, Inc. at 121 and 125 East Street. And we have a presentation from Mr. Barrett. Subject to the usual disclaimer, Council knows this well, but if you're following us, following along with us at home, you might need to know what this is. Mr. Barrett, we're Thank ready. you, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. This presentation will provide a brief overview of the recommendation report, which can be found on page 201 of tonight's agenda. The subject lands are located at the southeast corner of E Street and St. Anne's Court. A development application was submitted in May of last year to develop the site with six freehold townhouse dwelling units. As a result of staff comments and input received from the public, the development application was revised to reduce the overall number of units from six units to five units. This resulted in a number of design changes, including greater separation distance between private driveways for snow storage, new street tree plantings, and a more proportional front facade with less emphasis on the single garage door. The building height has also been reduced to 11 meters, and the site-specific bylaw would prohibit balconies above the second floor, prohibit rooftop terraces, and limit other balconies. The subject lands are located within the Brownie Village growth area and are designated as low-density residential. The applicant is seeking to redesignate the lands to medium-density residential. On December 4th of last year, Council adopted the Brawny Village Growth Area Official Plan Amendment, which also included a redesignation of the lands from low density to medium density residential. And this Official Plan Amendment is currently being reviewed by Halton Region as the approval authority. So with respect to the surrounding context, the Brawny Village Growth Area is one of the areas of the town which is intended to accommodate the majority of intensification. While the subject lands are located outside of the Brawny Village Main Street District, where development is primarily focused, the Livable Oakville Plan provides that the lands on the south side of Sovereign Street are to function as a transitional area to the stable residential neighborhood to the north with modest intensification. The proposed design, as revised, provides an appropriate form of intensification within an identified growth area while providing an appropriate transition to the adjacent stable residential community, which will be further advanced as part of the required site plan approval. With respect to implementation, a site-specific bylaw is proposed, which includes site-specific performance standards. Further, staff are of the opinion that given the subject development uh, location within a uh, stable residential neighborhood, Site plan approval is necessary to further advance a number of matters, including urban design, uh, a provision of a privacy fence along St. Anne's Court, landscaping of the rear yards, and a streetscape improvements. Uh, this will all assist in achieving a better integration of the proposed development within the surrounding context. In addition, staff reviewed a number of other items, including the following as part of the technical review, these matters have been addressed through the development application and will be advanced further through the required site plan application. With respect to public comments, a number of comments were received. Uh, staff have addressed these comments in the staff report through review of the development application and through revisions to the development application. In conclusion, staff are recommending approval as the following requirements have been met. Should Council agree with the analysis in the staff report, Council could consider passing the following resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrett, for that summary of the matter. Uh, Council, do you have questions? Councilor Elgar? Yeah, thank you very much. I just, if you go to page, uh, to bottom of page 219, the tree preservation, uh, I note that it, you st it stated there are 17 trees. All six of the trees located in the subject pro property are proposed to be removed. 
So that gives me 11 trees. But then I was trying to get down from 11 to where you were going, and I, I, I saw four. You mentioned the four trees, and you said three are ash, but I'm still missing some. Is there, um, I just wonder is it, if you can maybe just expand on that. Right, so there's six trees on the subject lands. I understand there were some ash trees on the subject lands that were included in the original arborist report that have since died and they were hazard and they were removed as well um, recently. Okay, so how would I read that? There are 17 trees, uh, six are going to be removed, leaves 11, and then there were uh, four town-owned trees, three of which are ash trees. So you got four, and of those four, there's three. But so what? What you're saying is, there, I guess you're saying there's more were dead or something that have already been removed. Is that is that how the numbers work? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there were um, ash trees that were removed from the site recently. The arborist report, as a standard requirement pursuant to the terms of reference, would also um, uh, identify boundary trees which are located on adjacent properties. So those trees are proposed to be preserved. Oh, so that's so uh, qu uh, quite a lot number of trees that are going to be pres preserved, or are they gone? Are they which ones are dead? How many are dead? So if you just work me back to, from the 17 down. So along East Street, there's four trees, three of which are ash. Okay. And um, they're in a declining state of health. Okay. Um, so if I go from the 11 and take away four. Right. So then you take away six for the trees that are located on the subject lands and are going to be removed as part of the subject development. And likely uh, what I could include in future reports are the boundary trees that are located on adjacent lands, uh, which would be preserved as part of the development. So if you take the six and four, you, you've got 10, so 17 from t and 10, you got, so seven are boundary trees and they're going to be preserved, that's what you're saying? Based on the information in the report, that's what I believe and I can certainly follow up with you after this meeting to confirm. Yeah, I know, yeah I'm just curious because I just, I just tried to run the numbers, so I'd appreciate that anyway, thank you. Any other questions? Are there any members of the public with information for council on this? Former member of council, Kurt Franklin, welcome back to these chambers. You don't know what you got yourself into, sir. <laughs> That's good. Uh, no, I'm Kurt Franklin here. I'm the planner for the owner of the lands. Um, Councillor Elgar, I'll gladly send you a copy of the Arborist Report tomorrow if you would like. Um, one of the issues that is promised to be addressed in the report through the site plan process is the planting of more trees. Um, so we will be addressing any shortcoming that is showing up in the current report with it in, through the site plan process. Good. And with that, we throw ourselves on the mercy of the council here. We have read the, the report and the recommendations and we concur with them. We would like to thank staff, uh, Paul and Charlie McConnell, for all their assistance in working with us on this. And we feel we have a pro product that we can be very proud of here. So please stand any questions that you might have. Well, let's find out uh, what kind of mercy council is offering tonight. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you, Worship. Um, I appreciate that, and I, I think we've been down this road. The people of, on St. Anne's Court appreciate all the work that you guys have done and your clients done, so thank you for that. Um, however, I, I do have grave concerns with the current uh, um, site, the way it is. Not only is it a horrible eyesore, there's safety concerns. There was a fire there. There was people yep. living in there. So uh, I believe we had a preliminary conversation about what we can do to make that site safe. Um, and I'm just wondering if you might be in a position now to tell me what measures you guys are going to be taking to secure those two sites and, and make them safer. Absolutely. We've actually initiated the uh, process for obtaining a, de a demolition permit for those buildings to just remove it. Uh, unfortunately, it is a process which does take a certain amount of time and effort. Um, we're working our way through it as fast as we can and um, appreciate the concerns of the residents and yourselves as you've shared them with us. Thank you very much. So are you going to hurry them along with a motion to approve? I, I would be happy to, uh, to um, put forward the motion to approve the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor O'Meara. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any? And that is carried and approved. Thank you, everybody. 
Now we come to number eight, the recommendation report for the official plan amendment for the northwest corner of Nag Iowa Boulevard and Burnhamthorpe Road West. And we have a presentation again from Mr. Barrett. We have no registered delegations. Um, Council, is it is it your opinion that this matter is uh, clear enough without a uh, presentation? Well, let's just let's just turn to the ward that contains it and respect the other councillors. Councillor Knoll. Thank you, Worship. I was actually going to suggest that we don't need to see the presentation. The report is uh, very self-explanatory and makes perfect sense, and I'd be happy to move it. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Questions or debate or discussion? All in favor? Uh, I don't believe there's anybody here, but I'll, I'll ask again, is there any member of the public uh, here with information on this file? Councillor Elgar, is, are you satisfied now? Oh, yeah, no, I was just, uh, I just didn't want to make sure we get everything proper. Well, thank you, Councillor, for your help. Uh, I, carry, I declare the motion carried and approved. Thank you. Number nine is the 2018 Heritage Grant Program. And uh, we have staff available to answer any questions if you need any. Um, otherwise, uh, we need a motion to that the 2018 funding allotments as attached in the report be approved. Councillor Giddings, is that your hand? It is. I'd, I'd love to approve that, having been on the committee to go through the applications. It's money very well spent All right. and uh, helping to preserve our character. Are there members of the public with information for council on this matter? All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that's carried. Number 10, perhaps this is the one. <laughs> the notice of intention to designate for 338 Spruce Street. Uh, staff is available to answer questions. Uh, the motion is that notice of intention to designate for the property at 338 Spruce Street, known as the Glasgow House, be issued in accordance with the report from Planning Services. Councillor Giddings is interested in moving it. Are there members of the public with information for council on this? Discussion? All in favor? And any opposed? That is carried and approved. Um, we have reached new business items, if I've been following correctly here, and that would be items of emergency, congratulatory, or condolence nature. Seeing none, Councillor Adams. I don't, I think we have item number 11 to deal with, the advisory committee minutes. All right. Oh yeah, look. Well, it's a little out of order, but what, I, I try uh, to be my, helpful. My paper, <laughs> but never mind. Thank you for that. Um, the Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee uh, recommendations and report uh, need to be um, approved and received. Councilor Chinna, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. I don't know how. I don't know how number eleven snuck down there. I wonder if. I wonder if this is even correct. Well, I called for new business. I didn't get any. Anybody else? All right. Then, it appears to me that it might be time to rise and report to council, and we actually still have minutes to do that. Councillor Robinson, uh, all those in favor? Uh, that is carried. I rise and report that the Committee of the Whole has met and made recommendations on consent item one, public hearing items two, three, and four, discussion items five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, confidential discussion items C1, C2, and new business item C3, and advisory committee minutes item 11, as noted by the clerk. I need a mover and seconder for the report. Councillor Adams, Councillor Elgar. Oh, let's, let's give Mr. Longo a chance to be on the minutes. Councillor Adams and Mr. Uh, Mr. Longo and Mr. Adams, in that order. All those in favor? And that is approved. Now, um, Council, that brings us to consideration and reading of the bylaws. We need a mover and seconder. Councillor Romero, Councillor Hutchins, all those in favor? The bylaws as listed in the agenda and noted by the clerk are approved. That completes our work. There was a moment when I thought we wouldn't be allowed to attend to our work, but anyway, we got through that with minutes to spare. And. Um, uh, it's been great working with you. Thank you for your time and attention, and we are adjourned.